You would presume that the leading promotion would have the most talent-filled and varied roster of athletes. For the most part, that is true, especially these days, but this hasn't always been the case, whether due to petty squabbles between the promotion and the fighter, or simply due to lack of interest on the UFC's behalf, these negotiations fall flat or are avoided entirely. And that's what we'll get into today. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and these are the 10 biggest fighters the UFC rejected. Number 10, Paulo Filo. There's a point where Paulo Filo was widely considered considered the second best middleweight in the world, just behind Anderson Silva. In the early days, he built up an insane hit list, going 14-0 in Pride before they were purchased by Zufa in 2007. After Pride was shut down, Philo opted to sign a four-fight contract with the WEC, claiming that Dana White didn't want him in the UFC because he would beat their entire roster. Yeah, I'm sure that was the case. Who knows why they didn't sign him, but that's what happened, so he went on to win the middleweight title in his WEC promotional debut, and to continue his impressive run, he defended his belt against Chael Sonnen in 2007, earning a controversial submission victory, which prompted an immediate rematch. But unfortunately, Filo's career began spiraling downwards by this point, first having to cancel the immediate rematch with Sonnen because of his addiction issues and subsequent rehab stint that forced a rescheduling of their bout. But the problems were far from over after he got out because Filo missed weight by 7 pounds, losing his first fight ever by decision in the process. After this loss to Sonnen, the WEC's middleweight division was absorbed by the UFC, who rejected Philo outright after they witnessed Philo's career careening towards rock bottom due to his cocaine and sleeping pill addiction. Philo continued his career with mixed success, never managing to regain the fire he had in pride, and finished out his career in 2014 by winning just once in his last seven fights. Number 9. Sergei Karatanov Kartanov is perhaps one of the most underrated heavyweights ever. He holds notable wins over MMA stars like Alistair Overeem, Andre Arlovsky, Fabrizio Overdoom. There was a time when a move to the UFC seemed obvious for Sergey, but it never materialized, primarily due to the fallout of his management team Golden Glory MMA and UFC president Dana White. Who else? Golden Glory had an unconventional way of paying athletes, where instead of having the UFC pay their athletes directly, Golden Glory wanted them to be paid first so that they could then divvy out the cash to their signed fighters, which very clearly opens a gap for managerial corruption. And because of this seemingly shady practice, the UFC wanted absolutely nothing to do with them, cutting all their fighters but Sergey once they purchased Strike Force. Only reason being is so that he could continue fighting in their heavyweight Grand Prix, and he was immediately cut once he got submitted by Josh Barnett in the semifinals. So that's that, I guess. He's currently 10-1 since the UFC sent him the door with his last win being over Roy Nelson. Number 8. Melvin Manhoof During Manhoof's prime, he was easily one of the most feared knockout artists who holds ferocious knockout wins over competitors like Sakuraba and Mark Hunt, yet he never did get a UFC contract. The closest he got to signing with him was back in 2013 after he was spotted meeting with Dana White at UFC 156. Manhoof at the time was on a three-fight win streak, but still the meeting never produced a contract for him because they were reportedly unimpressed with Manhoof's lackluster run in Strike Force, where he was finished in the first round by both Robbie Lawler and Tim Kennedy, so after being turned away by the UFC, he still remained optimistic, stating that his dream was to fight with the promotion. But two months after those talks, he lost his next two fights. As of late, he's been fighting in Bellator and is currently on a two-fight losing streak with a nearly two-year layoff due to injuries. Number Number 7. Alexander Emelianenko Alexander Emelianenko is the insane brother of Fedor Emelianenko. Alexander gained fame within the MMA community due to his early fights and pride. He built up a decent record going 9-2 before leaving the promotion in 2006 to fight Verdum in Holland. After being submitted in their bout, he returned to Russia. When asked why he didn't get signed to the UFC at this point, Alexander made a boisterous claim that he was too good and the UFC wouldn't want a Russian champion. This is number one bullshit. After a few dominant wins in Russia, he was signed to Affliction and was scheduled to fight Paul Buonatello. At the weigh-ins, though, it was announced that Alexander was refused a license by the California State Athletic Commission. Rumors started circulating that he was diagnosed with hepatitis B and would be unable to compete due to this condition. The rumors of hepatitis started circulating again when KSW said that he would not be allowed to fight there because he failed another medical test, but this time they said he had hepatitis C, not hepatitis B, as Affliction previously reported. 
Either way, it would appear he had a lot of issues getting cleared through medicals and larger promotions outside of M1, although he has heavily disputed these test results. And while this one's a little bit more murky than other entries, it is believed that the hepatitis results automatically made the UFC reject Alexander Emelianenko, as they would never be able to get him licensed to fight or ethically allow him to compete. Alexander was also arrested in 2014 for sexually assaulting his housemaid and received four years in prison. He is still fighting in Russia since then and is currently released on parole. Number six, King Mo. This one is a bit unfortunate because when the UFC turned him away, King Mo was considered one of the top contenders in the world. Back in 2010, he was on an impressive seven fight unbeaten win streak when he claimed the Strike Force light heavyweight belt by beating Gayard Musasi in a lopsided decision. At this point, a move to the UFC seemed inevitable for King Mo. And even though he lost the title shortly after, he quickly bounced back with finishes over Hodger Gracie and Lorenz Larkin. But things turned sour when it was later revealed that he tested positive for steroids whilst fighting Larkin. So because of the failed drug test, King Mo got handed a year suspension and the Larkin result was overturned to a no contest. Things got worse for him after he called the Nevada State Athletic Commissioner Pat Lundvall a racist bitch on Twitter, which he felt was evidenced by her harsh questioning at the hearing. She famously asked him, do you speak English? And quote, can you read? Due to King Mo's comments about Pat Lundvall and not to mention the positive test, the Zufa owned strike force decided to get rid of him, severing his contract. He's currently won one out of his last four fights. Number five, Ben Askren. Askren began his foray into MMA in 2009, quickly ascending the ranks by winning the Bellator welterweight title just one year after making his debut. You would have expected a world-class athlete like Askren to be a perfect fit for the UFC, especially considering he was riding a 12-fight undefeated winning streak when his Bellator contract expired in 2013. So at this time, he was finally a free agent, but the UFC refused to sign him. This was primarily due to a long-running feud with Dana White. Dana claimed that Askren's fighting style was too boring for the UFC and famously called him this guy is an absolute moron while Askren was highly critical of Dana and the UFC himself you know I am definitely not fond of this guy at all I, I want the chance to prove him the best welterweight in the world but I don't know if I'm, I'm willing to stoop to his level the bitter feud made it appear impossible that we would ever see Askren join the UFC. He later went on to join one championship where he retired with an 18-0 record before signing with the UFC in 2018. You know, that whole historical Demetrius Johnson trade. So although he did finally make it to the UFC, it's without a doubt one of the biggest and most credentialed fighters the UFC has ever turned down. It's just unfortunate he wasn't there during the time which would have been especially interesting considering GSP went on hiatus just after he was available, setting up a possibly explosive matchup with longtime NCAA rival Johnny Hendricks. Number four, Hicks and Gracie. In the jiu-jitsu community, Hicks and Gracie is widely considered to be one of the greatest grapplers of all time. Also at that time, he was unanimously considered the best of the legendary Gracie family. Yet surprisingly, he never found himself competing under the UFC banner. This was largely due to his own ludicrous financial demands and a family dispute with UFC co-founder Horian Gracie, who rejected his demands to compete at UFC 1 or any time after that. The other half and co-founder of the UFC UFC at the time, Art Davey originally wanted to sign Hickson to fight at UFC 1. Instead though, the UFC went with Hoist Gracie for their first event, the younger, scrawnier looking half-brother of Hickson, and this was due to the long-standing Gracie family belief that jiu-jitsu could be used by even much smaller practitioners to overcome any enemy regardless of their size. Clearly, they were right. Art Davey tells the story of how they tried to bring Hickson in one last time and what ended up being their final negotiation. What Hickson said was, in so many words, I, Mike Tyson is making $10 million. I want to make a million dollars. And we said to him, no one's making that kind of money in MMA right now in UFC. This frankly obvious choice to reject Hickson by the UFC ultimately worked out for them as Hoist went on to become a breakout star and the first true hero of the MMA world. It's just unfortunate we never saw Hickson against elite level competition. Number three, Gina Carano. Even though Gina Carano is one of the most monumental figures in all of mixed martial arts, being the first true star in women's MMA, she never managed to get herself into the world's leading promotion. Carano went 3-0 in her professional career and was then signed to Elite XC. Not only was she part 
of the first women's televised MMA fight against Yuli Kedzi on Showtime, which she won by a unanimous decision, but was also the reason for it. She was the star that finally made a promotion and television channel feel comfortable with the idea. Whilst Karana was on a tear, Dana White famously said in a 2007 interview with the Baltimore Sun, I'm not a huge fan of women fighting. He was also known for reportedly criticizing her ability to make weight, saying that he didn't feel comfortable bringing in women's MMA when their biggest star couldn't make weight. To be fair, she fought just eight times in her career and missed weight in four of them. Instead, Dana talked about the possibility of bringing her into the WEC, but that ultimately never materialized. In 2014, she flirted with the idea of a potential comeback against Ronda Rousey, but could never reach an agreement with the UFC and Dana White, saying, quote, she is the hardest fucking athlete we've ever dealt with. Perhaps it was sour grapes of the UFC not bringing her in during her early days on top, we'll likely never know. Number two, Chris Cyborg. Before UFC 232, Chris Cyborg was arguably the scariest female fighter in all human history. Cyborg began her fighting career by basically steamrolling over all the famous MMA legends like Shayna Baszler and the aforementioned Gina Carano. By 2011, she had built up an impressive hit list as a strike force queen, easily winning 10 fights with just one single loss, stemming back to her MMA debut in 2005. Things seemingly couldn't have looked better for Cyborg at the time, but that nearly all came tumbling down when it was revealed that she had tested positive for anabolic steroids. As a result, Cyborg was stripped of her featherweight belt and got handed a year suspension. This sent Cyborg to Invicta FC. Rousey went on to dominate the UFC's 135 pound division, and fans began to ponder what would happen if Cyborg and Ronda were to fight each other. The potential matchup seemed to slowly erode though, because Ronda was uninterested in moving up to 145, and Cyborg conversely was uninterested in moving down to 135. Joe Rogan and Tony Hinchcliffe also didn't help matters by ridiculing Cyborg on the JRE. Where would I start? Probably her like, dick. She's the only person that cuts weight by chopping off her dick. <laughs> And of course, Dana didn't mince words either. When I saw her at the MMA awards, she looked like Vanderlei Silva in a dress and heels. And she did. Cyborg did eventually sign with the UFC in 2016, but it took many years of dominance to finally get her there after repeatedly being turned down along the way. And until UFC 232, it was hard not to see her as the best women's fighter in the sport's history. Number one, Fedor Emelianenko. There's so many instances in which it felt like a lock that the UFC would sign Fedor. After the fall of Pride, Bodog, Affliction, Strikeforce, his return out of retirement, it just never panned out. And why does he matter so much? Well, to the uninitiated, he went on a near 10-year undefeated streak that included many UFC champions as well as unstoppable Pride legends. And especially around this time, from 2007 to 2009 when he was at his peak, Anderson Silva had only been signed to the UFC for a couple of years, while GSP's title reign was relatively short at the time as well. So Fedor was far and away considered the GOAT when the UFC discussions began and ultimately failed. So what happens? Why couldn't they come to terms? The biggest answer is M1 Global. This is a promotion that Fedor owned a stake in and was operated by his manager, Vadim Finkelstein. Or as Dana would refer to him as, You're a great manager, a dummy. Wild estimates from people close to Dana said Fedor was offered as much as $30 million for a six fight contract in the UFC. One that included an absolutely massive fight with Fedor versus Brock Lesnar. But this also meant no combat Sambo competitions for Fedor and no co-promotion. And Fedor was also smart enough to leverage his GOAT status to get big paydays outside of the UFC with Bodog, Affliction, and Strike Force, all of which allowed the M1 brand to co-promote with their events. I think the thing that really hammers this point home that it was M1 that was the crux of their issues comes from a statement by Fedor himself. I'm signed with M1 Global and this promotion is ready to organize such fights under our banner or in co-promoted events. Even Fedor's own brother, who I should point out he is not on good terms with now, but was on good terms with then, frankly and candidly said, you can deal with the UFC. I know that they have a flexible contract system. All these talks about strict contract terms with signing with the UFC come only from Vadim Finkelstein, who wants to push his own business projects, meaning M1, through Fedor's fights. And Dana certainly didn't help negotiations by trying to play classic hardball and going after Fedor and his manager, which I think is a key ingredient here. It's also important to point out that the rule of co-promotion was eventually broken by McGregor Entertainment and Showtime, as well as Connor's whiskey brand. But it's important to note that outside of the UFC, Fedor was never a hit in the pay-per-view market. The most he ever sold was 100,000 buys against Tim Sylvia. 
Either way, it never happened and it's only become less likely he'll fight under the top promotions banner. Had the UFC accepted Fedor's terms, you'd have to wonder what it all would have been like. But just as much as the UFC was rejecting him, I think Fedor did them, if I'm being honest.